when the formal part is over, we ask you to questions to you, to be for your questions. So don't be shy and participate actively. They are doing the program for you to improve your conversation with your students. So thank you so much for coming over this afternoon to those schools. And now I would like, love to, to greet um, uh, our Kansas State University. Hello, Rachman. Can you hear us? Your mic is on. Hello, National State. Can you Thousand students 
They will have many classes that are just lectures. We have several hundred students, and the professor simply lectures them, and they take notes, and they have an exam. At the Liberal Arts College, we'll have more classes with maybe 10 students, and they will all discuss the material together. And it's thought that this helps to make students more engaged in the education process. Liberal Arts, uh, well, it's, full, it's fully called Liberal Arts and Sciences. So it's just, it doesn't mean like art, it's just Liberal Arts is the term for like a general view. Of general science. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and another point I wanted to address is that in general, in the United States, grad schools where you can get a master's or a doctorate degree are separate from undergraduate schools. So even if you go to a university, say you go to Harvard University and you receive your bachelor's degree from Harvard, you, and you want to go to Harvard to get your master's, you have to apply to Harvard, even if you already go there. Because in general, graduate programs are completely separate from undergraduate programs. So I know that's one difference from here, where usually you would stay at the same school studying one thing, and you can continue to get additional degrees. But in America, if you want an additional degree, you have to apply again to a different school or to the same school. Okay, okay so one thing that everyone wants to know is which are the best colleges in the United States. Um, typically, one would say that the most respected college are these eight. They're called the Ivy League. Um, the Ivy League is a sports division, but it's also considered to be um, a designation for the quality of these universities. Um, of course, though, it depends on what you're looking for. So these are considered to be eight overall very good universities. But if you're looking to study a particular thing, or if you're looking for a smaller college, then you might look for something different. So I put up this link, um, which is a website that ranks colleges. So I don't know. Okay, so here, as you can see, is the ranking list. has several different categories. So national universities, you can see the first three are Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, which are all Ivy League schools. But if you look down at liberal arts colleges, which are smaller, then you see Williams, Amherst, and Swarthmore. So you can look at this website or some other rankings on the internet to decide what would be the best college for exactly what you're looking for. Um, I'd also like to say that throughout this presentation, the pictures I'm using are all from my college where I went, which was Oberlin College. Um, it was a liberal arts college, and it's 25 on that list. from your grades, either from high school or from your college, and also uh, 
something about what activities you did, your extracurricular activities. So for example, if you're applying to college, you might list that you were on a debate team or that you were a class president or something. And colleges really do look at this to try and get a sense of the whole person. Um, there's sort of a movement to move past test scores because they're not always the most accurate assessment. I'm sure you all know that American colleges are extremely expensive. Um, for right now, for a four-year college to get a bachelor's degree, tuition can be from about $20,000 per, per year to $50,000 per year. Um, I think the average right now is $36,000. And the most expensive college in the country, which is Sarah Lawrence College, is $59,000 per year. So. <laughs> Um, scholarships are very important, as well as student loans. Um, scholarships, there can be two kinds. One kind is merit-based, where if you are a very good student, you do very well on tests, and you have excellent grades, they will give you some money because they think you will do well at their college. And the other kind is need-based, and that's if you can fill out a form to say the income of your family and prove that you need help to go to the school, then they can give you some aid. Um, you can also file for aid from the U.S. government. Um, unfortunately, I don't know a lot about the process for international students. I hope that maybe after this, uh, we could ask some questions about that. But, um, oh, another thing is that for many students, um, if they have trouble finding money to go to college, they can do something called work study. And that means that uh, the, the university uh, guarantees that they have a job while they're there. So it could be a job working in the library or at the university bookstore or cafe or something. Um, and that helps a lot of students who need to work in order to go to school. Okay, college life. Um, obviously, this is an enormous part of American culture. Um, I think everyone has probably seen American colleges in movies. Um, so maybe you have a rough idea of how this works. Um, one very important part is the campus. American colleges are contained. Usually all the buildings are together on the campus. Um, and so it provides a space for all the students to feel like they're in a community. Um, you'll have class buildings, dormitories, you'll have the library, um, and often some kind of cafe or student hangout place all together. And usually students go to college away from their home, sometimes in the same state, sometimes in a different state, but usually in a different town. So um, this is a real social environment. Students, uh, we usually move out of our parents' house at age 18 and move into a dormitory. So, um, right, um, so there are also many, many clubs and groups. I'll look at some in a second. And that's a very important part of student life and your social environment. Finding people with the same interests as you is usually going to be how you're going to make friends because these colleges, um, it ranges in size. The smallest might be about 1,000 students, and the biggest could be 30,000. Uh, my college was about 3,000. So it's a, a small population, but you still uh, need to find like a social group. Um, and finally, fraternities and sororities. Um, this is actually even a little confusing to me because my college did not have fraternities and sororities, but basically they're national groups. Um, so you'll have like a chapter of this group at many different universities. They go by Greek letters. And they're basically opportunities to network and to find people to associate with. Um, so there will be a week near the beginning of the semester 
where the fraternities are all trying to find new members from the incoming class. And once you sign up for a fraternity or sorority, um, then you'll remain with those people for the rest of your time at, at university. Uh, fraternities, of course, are for men, and sororities are for women. Okay. So now I went to the website for my college, and I looked at their page on the student groups, because this is very important. So here's just the political groups, political politics and activism. So as you can see, it's widely represented. Over here we have uh, OC is Overland College, the Overland College Democrats, and over here Overland College Republicans. Um, so there's many different political causes, environmental sustainability, Latin American activists, peace and conflict studies, development group. Um, okay. And then here's music, theater, film performance. Um, some notable things, many, many, many colleges have a cappella groups. So that's uh, like singing groups, vocal groups, where they don't have instruments. It's um, a very common like university cultural phenomenon. So we have several, um, the acapellicans, the overtones, a lot of these are like bands, dance groups, um, improvisational clubs for that kind of theater, film cooperative, guitar association. These are publications we have on campus. Um, usually you'll have a college newspaper. Ours is over here, the Oberlin Review. Um, we also had a more comedic college newspaper. It also reported on the news, but more satire, and that was the great. And then there's some other publications. Um, the Plum Creek Review was literature, like a literary magazine. Uh, Spiral was the same thing, but it was more like science fiction. So these are all created by students, worked on by students, entirely produced by students. And the great thing about this kind of organization is that it gives you some skills while you're still in college that can help you find a job later. So it can give you some writing experience or some editing experience. And I know, like, I worked on the Plum Creek Review for one year, the literary magazine, and I'm listed on my resume as editing experience. So. Um, faith and identity. So here are some religious groups on campus. And I included this because I think the diversity is very interesting. Um, remember, I had quite a small college that I went to, and yet you still had all of these groups. Um, Christian groups, Jewish groups, Muslim groups, um, separate denominations, and then also some ethnic groups. You have the Japanese Student Association, the Korean Student Organization, Middle East Student Association. So um, it just goes to show like what kind of diversity you might find on campus. Again, this is even a small college. At a very large university, you would find even more diversity. And so it kind of makes it easier to find people who might have the same kind of values as you do. And here's some more uh, special interests. So these are more like hobbies that you would have or things you enjoy. Um, so you can say ballet, chess, astronomy, art, um, ski and snowboarding, um, lots of things like that. Meditation club, Lego club. And finally, we love sports. Um, so, as I'm sure you know, sports are a very large part of campus life at American colleges. Um, there are nationwide sports leagues, and these are sports for which there is no league. So they may have, um, they may set up some matches with other colleges that have these sports, but they're more unofficial, they're run by students. Um, so for instance, I had I knew someone who was in the fencing club sport, um, and they would go to competitions, um, dressage, equestrian courses, cycling, cheerleading, um, um, yeah, you may notice also we had a Quidditch team, which is a sport from Harry Potter. <laughs> um, I looked it up and actually they have that at eight colleges in America, so. You know they can have quite a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they play it on the ground. <laughs> um, okay. So, also room and board. Um, 
This is actually a pretty big expense. I know at my university, room and board is $5,000 per year. Um, so generally, you'll have a meal plan from the college, and you'll also have housing. Um, housing will be in dormitories, of course. Um, usually, these things are both mandatory for first year students. And then after that, you'll be more free to find your own housing, to have your own accommodations. Um, so meal plans, usually you would eat in some kind of cafeteria or dining hall where they prepare food. Um, and that, of course, works in different ways at different universities, so I won't kind of explain the system. Um, housing, of course, also varies, but uh, usually, especially as a first year, you are assigned a room. You don't get control over where you live. Um, there's some universities that have special housing for different fields of study. So for example, at my college, we had some language houses. We had Spanish house, French house, Russian house, German house. What's for What? What's for um, Well, basically, it was for people who study those languages so that they could practice. So those languages would be spoken in those houses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, 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 most colleges, yeah, most colleges, they actually give out a survey to match you with your roommate. So they'll ask you, like, how late do you stay up? How messy is your room? You know, <laughs> to try to make sure that you're matched with someone who you'll work with. But um, if you really have a problem, sometimes it is possible to switch. Um, they can put you on, like, a list to look for housing. And then if someone leaves their room for some reason, you can get it. So. Um, it honestly depends on where you are, like what college university. Like at my college, we lived in a small town, so we couldn't get our own apartment until the fourth year. Um, usually, I would say usually it's cheaper to live on campus um, than to get your own apartment, but many people, of course, prefer to get their own apartment because they're more dependent. Um, so basically, it depends on how much housing is available where you live. Um, also, this is where I lived for two years of college, this building. Um, and that was a special, like, special housing that was in the women's dorm. So usually it's mixed, but you could apply to live there if you wanted to. Okay. Oh, and the other thing about food is some universities have special meal plans for special, like, dietary needs. Um, and so one example is that at my school, we had uh, one dining hall that was kosher and halal. So for those students who needed that kind of food, they could go there. Okay, um, and finally we'll talk about how studies work. Um, so you probably know like the field that is your specialization is your major. Um, but one big difference between education in the U.S. and education here is that we don't have faculties. We have departments, but they're all part of the same branch of the university. So basically what it means is that um, you can take class, a class in any department that you want. Um, so usually uh, you pick your major at the end of the second year of college. You, often you know before that what it will be, but you don't have to declare your major until the end of the second year. So for example, for my first year of college, I took a psychology class, I took a couple English classes, um, I took a Spanish course, uh, philosophy, I think, some computer programming. So none of these ended up being what I studied for my major, um, because I, my major was Russian language and literature. <coughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, but I didn't start taking Russian until my second year of college. So, um, often you'll have distribution of practices which I wrote there. Um, what that means is that they'll require that you take a certain amount of courses in different fields before you choose. This is very often with liberal arts colleges, since liberal arts is supposed to 
have a more broad general view of education than just one field. Um, so for example, again, this is my university. Um, so we had a system where you had to take nine credits each in natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. So for example, I am not very excited by science. <laughs> it's not my area. I don't do well in it. But I have to take nine credits in natural sciences. Um, which I did with geology. The other thing is we also have a math requirement and you have to take at least one course that is intensive with writing. So you have to um, have a writing requirement. And we also have one more requirement which is cultural diversity. So you have to take at least one course that has um, something to do with the culture outside of the United States. For me this was no problem because my major was Russian. So almost all of my classes have this cultural diversity credit. Um, the other thing is, uh, you're always allowed to choose your classes in American universities. Um, I don't know how it works here. I work at the Architecture University, and there I know they have set curriculum. The students don't choose which classes they take. Um, so for us, we have what's called a credit system. Every class has an assigned number of credits. So you'll have a requirement that you have to take a certain number of credits, um, but not specific classes. So for example, for my major, the Russian department requires that you have 36 Russian credits. Um, classes are usually three or four credits each. And within that, they say you have to take you know, this many language courses, you have to take five culture courses, you have to take at least one course that's this level of difficulty. So there's rules that you have to go by, but in general I can say, okay, I have to take five culture courses, I want one to be this film course, or I want to take this course on 18th century literature. Um, and as long as it has the right number of credits, then I can take it. So that's kind of how we control um, what our, how our education works. Um, and that's important because that also tells you like what classes we must take to graduate. Okay, that's about it, I think. Yeah. So does anyone have any questions now? Ohio. I'm from Pennsylvania. Yeah, so I went to a different state.
advising, which is open to all of you guys, and you just go to our advisor, ask you questions, and they provide you with the answers. Like they take you from the very beginning of the application process. I mean, they first give you the information about the colleges, actually, Montana covered uh, quite a bit of the US education system and colleges and universities. But if you go to the advisor, you will get even more extensive uh, information, and they will try to match your interests with the, with the colleges available, universities available. They will get you through the whole application process. They will get you prepared for the tests and application process. Uh, will help you to apply and finally get the results. And then after, afterwards, still work with you to get you prepared uh, to visit the United States for your studies. So we have a bunch of uh, opportunities, like exchanges that's a different part of it. They are covered, they are funded. Uh, it's a little bit harder for you, might be harder for you to actually go through the competition and uh, finally be a winner and uh, study what education is the advising service that I mentioned. Uh, I've actually brought some um, just a second brochures. You can also apply for a Fulbright. Yes, I will mention Fulbright. Yeah. Yeah. Every year fewer and fewer, but 
uh, still being run by uh, IDEX. Probably you have heard about this program. It's called Undergraduate Global Undergraduate Exchange Program, we in short we call it UGRAD. It's open for first, second, and third year um, undergraduate students. You have to have fluent English, and you have to have some uh, like community involvement uh, experience, volunteer experience to be competitive and uh, you will get a chance to study one year of undergraduate studies in the States. It's another option. One more thing that is currently open, uh, how many of you are students of first, second or third year? Second, first, second, third. Okay, quite a few actually. Uh, we, the embassy has just recently announced a program which is called SUSI. It's Summer Institute for um, five weeks, right? Great program. Uh, it's for public policy making and all this stuff. Uh, you, uh, the application process is very simple. You just go to our website, uh, write it, and then complete it right there, and push the submit button. It will come to my account. We will select five students from Azerbaijan to send to the States during the summer months for five weeks, and five students from Armenia, Georgia, and Turkey will join you in the States, and it's going to be a huge great program. So, it's all be said. Last question. Um, I have two years of the, I have like I have a student and I'm not right now for two years. Mm -hmm. and just, my two years actually ends this summer. Can I start by the two years? Yes, well actually that two years uh, it's it's not related to any of the programs that you can apply immediately after you become a transport. Right. Well it can be programs requirement, but that J2 requirement is uh, applicable only if you are planning to move to the States or if you are applying to a MIG immigrant visa or a work visa, only in that case you have to stay in your country two years. But you are absolutely welcome to apply to any kind of other exchange programs. Yes, definitely you can apply. Any other questions? Or any other, uh, maybe, like, studying opportunities that you're interested in? It's, uh, I guess it's, it will be happening starting mid-June till the end of July. And what's the date? Uh, we don't know yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, these institutes are being tendered at this moment in the States, so they will let us know later. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, good. Thank you for reminding me. This is actually the, um, how to say, the biggest part that we're trying to promote at the embassy right now. Um, it is really possible. I mean, yes, as Madalena mentioned, some financial support, you want, there might be some financial support maybe from your parents and maybe student loans and this stuff, but there are a lot of colleges uh, and the states that are available and you can financially, a lot of students can financially support. So if you go to our advisors, you will just you will get the numbers and all this stuff here uh, from the brochures. You can approach our advisors and they will give you all the information. Uh, what to do, how to start, where to go, what kind of papers you need to like prepare or what, what kind of tests. The same case that I'm going to mention also might be required. For some colleges, they even stop actually requiring exactly. So it's possible just to send your application if you have some financial support, just to send out your application and most probably you will get a positive answer and we will post up. And we, and our advisors also probably will advise you to choose to focus on community colleges. It's cheaper, it's uh, more available. You start at community college, it's two year studies, and then, uh, but the credits that you are gaining there, they are trans you can transfer them later to a like, four year undergraduate. But for foreign for undergraduate, you only study two of them because you already have two year two year college, right? Mm -hmm. right? Yes, two year college, chemical college studies, and plus two year undergraduate from another university. And this is considered as a like a completed undergraduate studies. Yeah, community colleges might be like five thousand dollars a year instead of yeah. thirty thousand. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I myself uh, am considering uh, for my son which is like 16 years old, the community college, because it's really like financially, um, it's like actually, um, you can you can allow yourself uh, community college. Yeah. Yes, and then the following two years, um, we'll see. <laughs> so. so for me, like I had a merit scholarship, because my college costs $50,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if 
if you go to our advisors, they, they can actually put you in touch with a couple students that have gone through this process. And they can tell you, they can share with you their stories, and you will see really it's really possible. And, and, uh, actually, so I would advise them to take the graduate questions and definitely use the services of our It's free service, absolutely. If you go to any other companies that are offering like education abroad in Europe and UK and USA, only for getting there, entering their office and sitting in front of them and asking your questions, you will be you will be charged a fee. But this is free service. You can ask as many questions as you have, you will be answered and finally there's a result. And also a lot of institutions in the US, they really want foreign students. Like they want to have diversity, right. they want to have they, they like to be able to say like this percentage of our students are from different countries. Yeah, absolutely like, right. Yeah, so I think that Azerbaijan, they would love to have students from Azerbaijan. Well, some of the universities actually, specifically for Azerbaijan, started uh, giving uh, scholarships. Really? So if we are getting application from Azerbaijani students, so I can, and if the applicant, of course, is a successful one, they are giving LinkedIn University or something, or, and, and the advisors know they do this at the university. So they are looking for students from Azerbaijan. So they have a special part of money that they allocated only for you guys. So just go and apply. I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. I'm here because like Fulbright is very competitive, but I thought it can't hurt to apply. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. 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 You submit its own motivation because we really don't want to get much of your time. Uh, motivation letter it gives us some uh, opinion, some 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 impressions about you and why you are interested and what your plans are in the future. Uh, we will screen uh, the, the, the the essays first, and if we like your essay, and uh, we might interview, we might invite you to the interview. Um, so. I think if I'm not sure if I correctly remember the deadline is early January. Um, we have to submit our nominations by the end of January. So it means like mid January you might probably hear from us. Um, question. Um, question. Um, question. Um, question. Yes, that's not a big amount of plus for you <laughs> in your case, because we are looking for the students who actually have limited US experience. Athletics is a one-year, like, huge program, but still, if you can justify, if you can grab our interest in your essay, you might have a chance. Any other questions? Yeah? What kind of essays do they ask for For Susie or for in general? This? In general. Uh, that's a different question. I should. Sure. Yeah. 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 Makes one personal statement. <laughs> Usually, in, in terms of, like, basically, any college application or program application that's done, you have to write at least two essays. One will be to justify why you want or need to be in the program or college. So you can say, this is why I'm interested in being in this program, this is what I would do. And usually the second one is a personal essay. Yeah. So then you'll write about some event in your life or something so they have some sense of who you are and you can sort of make your case. Mm -hmm. Well, again, come to the sessions that our advisors are doing. They are uh, organizing workshops on how to write uh, strong personal statements or strong field of study essays. Uh, it is really happening, so I would advise you at least. Uh, how many of you have visited? Uh, we have a center at Caspian Business uh, Plaza, second uh, second floor. Oh, three. Uh, I would advise you to be a frequent visitor of this center because. The, there are a lot of interesting, uh, interesting events, workshops, and seminars and trainings happening at that center. One of them, one of them actually is about like, how to write, uh, how to develop a essay, and how to, um, how to write an application. Uh, I mean, how to be accessible in an application, the whole application process, and, uh, some suggestions about recommendation letters. So, yeah, I mean, you, that would be a good place where you could give that information more broadly. I'm a, an expert in writing down like essays. <laughs> That's why I know, unfortunately I can't. But I, I know that it should be really very interesting. That even the first, first like maybe first couple sentences, 
but it will be just giving me some knowledge here and here and some of these now. Thursday, Monday, so that was Saturday. Okay. Because he will be a challenge. He's probably going to be a challenge.